welcome to The Joys of Binge Reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. Today we're talking to cosy mysteries queen Peg Cochran, whose bright and funny murder series are set in a small town America that's peopled with colourful characters, resourceful amateur women sleuths, lots of red herring clues, and food, always food, sometimes with recipes to go along with it. Therefore, anyone who enjoys titillating stories that are laced with a bit of romance as well. Before we get to hear from Peg, though, just a reminder that the show notes for this binge reading episode are available at the website thejoysofbingereading.com forward slash Peg C. That's where you'll find links to Peg's website and books. You'll find a free ebook and also information on how to subscribe to future episodes of this podcast if you like what you hear and decide you don't want to miss out. But now, here's Peg. Hello there, Peg, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. That's great. Look, you've written lots of different series. There's quite quite a you know a large number actually. But whether it's Gigi in her healthy locale catering business in Gourmet Delight or Shelby with her Love Blossom farm jellies in the Farmer's Daughter series, they seem to have one thing in common, and that's a love of food and cooking. So I wondered, was there a once upon a time moment when you had to decide for yourself what came first, the chance of working in a career with food or writing fiction? Not really. I've always wanted to write fiction and um, a career in food. I love to cook and I love to do that in my spare time and feed my family and entertain and so forth. But um, to be an act, to actually be a chef is a very physically demanding job. And I'm a fairly small person, um, at least height wise. So um, it, it really wasn't ever on my radar as something I wanted to do professionally. I did think at one time that maybe catering might be interesting, but after giving one or two parties at home, I changed my mind pretty quickly. It's an intense amount of work. So, um, yes, sure. I did sort of sublimate my love of writing into cooking for a while. And then I realized I needed to get more serious about the writing and maybe eat a little less. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. It's also fairly um, hard on the health, isn't it, with the hours and, and the temptation to drink when you close the cafe or whatever in the evening. So I know that quite a few people fall into um, some problems just with controlling the discipline in their life in that field of work. So yes. you probably chose the healthier option, even though it is sitting in front of a computer. Right, which they're now telling us is as deadly as smoking. So I don't know. So I gather you haven't tried a stand-up desk yet. <laughs> I Sometimes I take my computer into the kitchen and I'll type at the counter. Um, yes. I had a bad bout of sciatica for nine months where it was extremely painful to sit. So I did do a little more work standing up. I also managed to figure out how to lie down on the sofa and work, and that was a lot more comfortable. So <laughs> I didn't really learn too much from that experience. Yeah, yeah. Just continuing on the food theme for a moment, that sense of nurturing by creating um, enjoyable set settings and scenes around food, it's there even in the books that don't have a food theme, like the Sweet Nothings lingerie series, where amongst other things, we have edible cupcakes with pretty flowers on top and um, Tennessee tea recipes and things. I wondered if you'd ever thought of doing recipe books in addition to your um, your fiction, like you could have the Love Blossom Farm recipe book or the Gourmet Delight series recipe books. Has that ever been something you'd consider doing? I know some cozy authors who have done that, and I've looked at the idea, but it is 
frankly, it would be too much work and it would take too much time away from my writing. Um, I could imagine myself contributing to a cookbook. That would be a lot of fun. But to create my own, um, I also have a day job, so my time is really um, limited. But when I retire, I'm not ruling it out. So sure, sure. It it um I can Im- I can imagine trying because you actually have a high production level. So doing that with a day job must be quite a, quite a feat, I must say. Charming settings are part of what we've come to expect from you as Peg or as Meg, your alter ego. And the Sweet Nothings lingerie series, for example, has some lovely details. Things like the fact that the famous sweater girls, Marilyn Monroe and Lana Turner, wore a bra that was dubbed the bullet bra. I don't know why, but that kind of detail just delights and fascinates me for, as one for, as a reader, and I'm sure many others. Do you spend a lot of time researching your settings? Um, not the setting so much as the details of my protagonist's job and hobby. Um, many of the settings that I've used, actually the, the only real setting I've used so far was um, Paris, Tennessee in the lingerie series. Um, the other settings are made up, but the research, definitely, I've done the research and I love doing that. I could fall down that rabbit hole for hours at a time um, on Google so I have to discipline myself as to what is, you know, how much time I'm going to spend looking things up. But you find those little nuggets, and I think it adds to the story. And cozy readers like that. They're very smart people. They like to learn things. So I'm learning right along with them. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think that is part of the charm of these mystery books. Your decision to have an alter ego in the form of Meg London, why did you decide that you needed to write under two different names? Well, that's an interesting situation. Um, That was what is known as a work for hire. Uh, Penguin, editor at Penguin, had the idea for the Sweet Nothings lingerie series. And she sketched out some the protagonist and a few other people that appear in the book. And then they go out and they hire a a writer to write the series for them. Now, they own all the rights. They own the characters, the setting, everything that you create for them, including the name that goes on the book. So I wasn't willing to sell my own name. So obviously, I chose a pen name for that series. Oh, great. And was that a good experience to to write in that under that arrangement? It was fantastic. It was actually my entree into the whole um, getting my toe in the door in publishing. Um, A writer friend alerted me to the opportunity. Um, I sort of auditioned, I guess you'd call it, by creating three sample chapters based on what I got from the editor. Uh, They like my style, and so they hired me to write the book. And shortly after I started that, I sold them my own series, which was the Gourmet series. So it, it was a great opportunity. And it also is, um, it sort of tests your imagination to work around a concept someone else has come up with. But that was just for the first book. Um, the subsequent two books, I was totally on my own for plot and everything else. And uh, some of the characters are ones that I made up myself. So there was a fair amount of freedom still. Yeah, well, that's that sounds great. You certainly would never pick a difference in in the intimacy that you have with the characters. So that's a real um, compliment to your ability to imagine yourself into those situations. No, oh, thank you. Um, the other common theme that I've noticed in the ones I've read is that there often seems to pop up a little dog and and often a West Highland Terrier. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm right about the breed, but. Um, I assume you might have dogs yourself? Um, Yes, there's a a little Westie named Reg sleeping right at my feet at this very moment. (laughs) So he's he's wormed his way into a couple of books. Whenever I'm working, he literally is right by my side the whole time. So um, he's he's asked to be in several of them, and I've I've accommodated him for that. I love the way that he appears on, on the covers of a lot of the Gourmet Delight books. Those are delightful covers with him very prominent there. <laughs> yes, and he, he if you'll notice if you look at the covers, he got fatter and fatter as, as the series went on. <laughs> 
clearly he was not eating the the um, diet food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gorgeous. Well, perhaps turning away from specific books to a, a little bit wider look at your career, Peg, um, your heroines are mostly widowed or divorced single women who are facing loss and or disappointment or have in the past faced loss and they're working hard to build a, a successful life again. I wonder, that is a bit of a theme in your work and I wondered if that particular situation or challenge um, had special interest for you. Well, it is a little bit of, I hate to use the word formula, but a cozy formula, taking your character from a, a previous life, plopping her into a new one and watching her adapt. Um, I do have a little experience with that. I was widowed. Um, my husband was 44 when he died and I had two children, six and 12. So in a sense, I did have that experience of starting over. I, I bought a new house, changed jobs, did things like that. So it does speak to me, even though, as I've said, a lot of cozy writers go that route. I, I did have some intimacy with that experience. Sure, sure. If there was a mystery in your own life that could be a plot line for a book, what would it be? Well, I don't know how I would plot this out, but um, I was 12 years old when my girlfriend told me that I was a twin. And I argued with her. I said, no, absolutely not. There's no way I'm, I'm not a twin. I, I would know that. And uh, But I was curious enough that I went to my mother and I asked her. And she said, yes, you were, you are, were a twin. My twin died at birth. And um, she never told me. Uh, she told her friend, who was my girlfriend's mother, my girlfriend's mother told her, and she told me, and that's how I found out the big secret. I don't know if she planned to ever tell me or not. Gosh, that seems to be quite quite a revelation and something that could spark a, a series in, in your mind if you, if you gave it some thought. Yes. Yeah. Where, whereabouts were you born? Um, in New Jersey. In a, in a kind of city kind of setting, were you? Um, a suburb, it, you know, a fairly densely populated suburb. We were uh, about 25 miles outside New York City. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So very urban environment. Yes, yes. Because a lot of your books are set in small, very much in small town. Um, I suppose that's another cozy mystery uh, Theme that they are often are in, in quite restricted settings where you have a small community of people who all know each other well and, and um, so that they all chat and have the same sorts of interests and looking over each other's shoulders and there's a gossip thing going on. You haven't lived in that kind of setting yourself? Um, well, our town was... in. <laughs> We had about 20,000 people, but you had smaller communities within the town. The, um, the parents uh, at school, for instance, your kids, parents, and so forth, those circles, definitely there was the same kind of gossiping and, and knowing secrets about each other or trying to find them out. So yes. you, you kind of created a small community within a larger one, a little bit like some of the Cozy's Cleo Coyle's books, for instance, are set in New York City, but she's drilled down to one specific neighborhood and one specific coffee shop within that neighborhood to create that same community feeling that you you need for one of these mysteries. Sure. I get the feeling that you have quite a network of friends within mystery authors and that you have become very much part of a community. Definitely. It's a wonderful community. Um, everyone is so helpful, um, willing to do anything, willing to help a new person. Um, there's a huge online community. Uh, that's the, the marvel of the internet, that we can all get together like that. And um, there are conferences where you can actually meet face to face. I've So far, I've only been to one of them. But I did meet some of my um, best online friends there, which was fun to see them face to face. But um, they are very helpful. And actually, 
I think that, well, they definitely contributed to my career because they alerted me to the opportunity to do that work for hire, which I would never have known about otherwise. Sure. And at the point that you got that work for hire job, how many books had you written for yourself at that stage? Ooh, that's a tough question. Probably about six at that point. And you'd been looking for a publisher for those, had you? I just kept on writing in the meantime while you were looking for a publisher. Yes. Actually, the first step is really to get an agent. Very yes. few publishers take on agented work. So I did get an agent for the first book I wrote. Um, unfortunately, it never went anywhere. I was convinced that I was going to be a bestseller overnight, but... Sadly, that didn't happen. <laughs> but, um, you know, I did just keep going. That's what you have to do. Sure. And did that book ever see the light of day, your first book? No, it's hidden. I Actually, I think it's on a floppy disk, if you can imagine. So <laughs> I think it's pretty much gone from uh, from the world at this point. One of the things that, that, that people love about mysteries, and in fact, well, I do anyway, is that sense of, as you say, with Paris, Tennessee, that you could plop down there and visit. And I was wondering, if you were going to organise a magical mystery literary tour for any of your series, where would you trip advise people to go? And, I, and I'm thinking of things like perhaps a favourite food place or um, cooking schools or even an antique lingerie museum. When I, when I was reading the sweet lingerie series, I was sweet nothing. So I was thinking, gosh, I've never really thought about antique lingerie. I wonder if there's somewhere you could go and see all these things. So tell me, is there? <laughs> well, I don't know if there's, there are definitely places online that you can, can see beautiful pictures of vintage lingerie. And I, I definitely accessed a lot of those. In terms of cooking, um, I'd have to say, a big city like New York City is a fantastic place to go. Uh, you can try every kind of cuisine you can imagine, from Tibetan to Korean to Chinese to Indian. Um, you you could set up a wonderful tour of all different kinds of tastes um, in a in a big city, New York, Chicago, etc. We just recently went to Italy and had a wonderful time tasting the food there. So I definitely recommend that too. Sure, sure. It sounds like it might be the topic for future blog posts for you. <laughs> Good idea. I'm always <laughs> looking for those. <laughs> Turning to you as a reader, because this is called the Joys of Binge Reading podcast, did you in the past or, or do you ever at the moment have the opportunity to occasionally binge read? I can't really do it very much now, but I've certainly done it in the past. Um, it, even when I was younger, my mother was always urging me to go, go outside and play. It's beautiful out, go outside. And I'd be holed up in my bedroom with a book. I would just read for hours and hours on end. And before I had responsibilities of family and so forth, Definitely, I could spend an entire weekend with books. Loved it. Um, I do remember one time pretending to be sick so I could stay home from school to finish Gone with the Wind, which I had discovered on my mother's bookshelf. Um, now I try to give myself an hour at the end of the day to read. I think it's important as a writer to keep reading and also because I love it. I'd much rather read than watch TV. And so is there anything that you're binge reading at the moment that you'd like to share with our listeners that you'd recommend or that you're particularly enjoying? Not really. I've read a couple of the latest um, sort of psychological suspense, domestic suspense, I think they're calling it. Um, the problem is I can never remember the titles. I read them on my Kindle, so you're not constantly looking at the cover. Um, certainly Gone Girl was... A huge favorite. Uh, I would love to be able to write something like that. And um, there have been a couple like that. There's nothing, I've been skipping around between mysteries, women's fiction, um, some nonfiction as well. Um, I'll read just about anything that you put in my hands. So, certainly, sure. Just perhaps circling around, we've surveyed your career from the start, how you got your start. 
if you were doing it all over again, is there anything you would change? And if so, what would that be? I would have started sooner. I started, I did start writing in my early 20s and I allowed myself to get discouraged. At the time, we, you know, we didn't have, didn't have the computer. I wrote on a typewriter, didn't have the internet, which brought so much information and the comradeship of other writers. So it was easier to, to feel, why am I doing this? Why bother? But I wish I had persisted because I think I would have succeeded sooner and I would be able to do this longer because I don't ever want to stop doing it. Um, I think that's really the key is just to be persistent until you, um, until you, you're, the opening comes and you're ready for it. Would you like to write full time or is it preference to have a life outside of your writing that um, means that you continue to do your your outside work? I would I would love to write full time. Um, there is actually no such thing as writing full time because half of it, um, to be honest with you, is marketing. Uh, it's very important. The publishers, unless you are a huge, huge, big name, and you get the full page ads in the New York Times, um, you have to do a lot of that marketing yourself, and it's it's just you know, keeping at it, it's being on Facebook and having conversations with people, it's being on Twitter. And that takes up a fair amount of time. So I think it would balance out the loneliness, if you will, of this, the solitariness of writing. Um, I definitely though would want to, you know, let's say I was writing, you know, full time all day. I would definitely want to do some volunteer work or take a class or something to get out and kind of fill the well, be stimulated by outside things. Otherwise, you don't have anything to write about. Sure, sure. Book three in The Farmer's Daughter, Sewed to Death, has just come out a few months ago, I think. What else have you got in the... Sorry? I'm sorry, it was actually book number two oh, sorry. in that series. Book number two, sorry, yeah. And I saw on social media that there was a hint that you might have a historical mystery series planned. I think I read something somewhere about that. Did I? Is there something new in the works? Yes, I'm working on that right now. Um, it's tentatively called the Reluctant Debutante series. It's set in 1938. It starts in 38, the first book. Um, right now I have a contract for three books through Alibi, which is an imprint of Random House. And um, it's a new direction. I, I'm loving it. I'm love, I love that time period. So this gives me an excuse to watch old movies and read stories of life in those times. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that. And can you tell where, us where that one's set? Oh, New York City, where else, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking that would probably be the case, yeah. Perfect, uh, perfect setting for it, with the glitz and the glam of the 30s. Yeah, just that's post-stock market crash, isn't it? So Yeah, just after um, the crash and just before the war gets really gets started. Yeah, yeah. And what about the other, like Gourmet Delight and... and um, some of the ones we haven't mentioned, like the Cranberry Cove, the Berry series, anything else happening on other, on those, or are you foc focusing on this new one? Well, I'll have a new, um, a new Cranberry Cove book coming out from a different publisher called Beyond the Page, and it is due in February, so my guess it will be coming out perhaps around the springtime of, of 2018. And I have another ebook only series called the Lucille series that is set in New Jersey with a very um, a middle aged Italian housewife. Bit of a cliche, but um, if if you've read um, Stephanie Plum, just imagine Stephanie Plum older with a family. That's kind of what the character is about. So the fifth book in that series will be coming out within the next couple of months. That sounds great fun. You mentioned that it's ebook only. I guess that is still through a publisher, is it? You've never been tempted to indie publish? I did indie publish two um, young adult books. Uh-huh. 
And um, <clears throat> it's, but I'm, I prefer going through a publisher who's going to provide editing because I think that's very important for the quality of the work. Uh, there's so many things a writer can miss and your excitement and enthusiasm over the story, the details can, can be murky. Um, also they do all the work, the formatting, the cover, and that, that lets you put your time into the part that you do best. Yeah. 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 Peg, it's been great talking to you today, but just before we finish, can you tell people where they can find you online? Yes, I have a website that desperately needs updating, but it's there. It's uh, pegcochran.com. I'm on Facebook at facebook.com slash pegcochran. And also on Twitter, which is at pegcochran. And you're fairly uh, active on social media, I think, from what I've seen. Yes, yeah, sometimes too much. I I should probably spend more time working than being on social media, but I enjoy it. And I enjoy the readers that I get to connect with. And um, I have an author page. I, people have also found my personal page, which isn't that personal. Um, but I would suggest connecting with me on the author page. I also have a lot of news about other authors and their giveaways and things like that. And it's, it's fun. We have some fun times there. That sounds great. So, look, thank you very much for being with us today and we look forward to more more books. I'm certainly excited about the historical mystery series that's coming up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the Joys of Binge Reading podcast. You can find all the details and links for this episode at www.thejoysofbingereading.com. We'd love to hear your comments and suggestions for who you'd like us to interview next. And if you enjoyed the show, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or a similar provider so you won't miss out on future guests. Thanks for joining us and happy reading.